Are they doing anything um, on a more regional level about getting pharmaceuticals out of the water? She, she was asking if, if they're doing anything on a regional water level about getting pharmaceuticals out of waters. Um, not specifically, but in general, I think drinking water plants are moving to treatment options that remove chemicals. Um, well, either um, like nanofiltration or carbon filtration, um, both can provide some chemical removal. Those are, those are actually the main options. The, the, the one thing I didn't talk about in drinking water and the, the, is the notion that um, I personally think every drinking water tap should have a filter on it. I think point of use filters should actually be part of the entire drinking water supply system. And actually, I, I would like to see water utilities get involved in helping you know, provide these on a costly basis, helping maintain them. It, because if you have you know, all those levels of possible contamination, why not put your filter right next to where you drink the water so you don't have to worry about bad pipes, you don't have to worry about inadequate treatment, you don't have to worry about somebody contaminating the distribution system. So I think, you know, I'm a big believer in point of use filters. Hi, good morning. I was wondering, um, I was intrigued about desalinization plants. Yeah. Given today's technology and, you know, as we sit here today, what would be the increase in cost to uh, average consumer with desalinization versus, say, our current water bill? Um, that's a good question. Uh, he was, uh, and I'm not, sh I have to say, I don't, uh, I don't have the answer in hand. I think um, clearly it's, it's, I mean, we pay so little for our drinking water that the cost of those plants is actually not that huge, except for the fact that we're wasting most of that purified water. You know, in, in, in the sense that we're going to you know, use it to flush toilets or wash cars. So that's, you know, the, one of the biggest cost drivers is just the way we use water uh, more than just the cost of the treatment plants. And, and the cost will depend a lot on where that plant is built, how it's powered, um, but the economics of those plants, I, I don't know well enough to give you the answer that I think you'd like to have, so sorry. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, what do you think about the, the use of geoengineering and its effect upon the hydro, disrupting the hydrological cycle, which is what's happening right now in California? Um, what's, and what sort of geoengineering do you have in mind? Well, geoengineering, using aerosol sprays in the sky to try to block a certain percentage of the sun's radiation solar radiation management, and also uses of uh, weather modification that actually moves the jet stream, which is causing part of the global warming. I wonder if you have any opinions on that. Um, I think you're getting outside of my area of expertise a little bit in terms of weather modification. Um, I, you know, I think, but I will say, I think that kind of technological solution to global warming right. is, is, to my mind, a bit wrong-headed because then, okay, A, I don't think it's going to work, and B, even if it did work, what are we committing ourselves to in right. terms of now we're going to manage the entire global uh, weather and hydrologic cycle? Right, we're going to pollute the planet and, and the yeah. soils and so forth. Right, right. <clears throat> I mean, I think um, we tend to underestimate how well how good a job nature does with these right. things. And exactly. so I'm not a big fan of the, those kinds of technical fixes. Yeah, there are great water filters that, by the way, yeah. for personal use for everybody. Yeah. And if you just do some research on them. They're easy to find. I mean, yeah. you know, you just go to yeah. you know, a Home and, Depot and it, or something. And it's, well, actually, it's worth it going beyond that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something, it's one of those things where, where when you buy the inexpensive you know, when they give you the inexpensive printer with the computer, you think that's a good deal only until you find right. out that it costs you $40 right. every month 
for for the ink, all right? And it's the same thing with the water filters. You buy the in inexpensive are you, water are you filter. Talking about cartridge sales devices? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so you, you buy the inexpensive the filter and you yeah. end up spending a huge amount of money on, on cartridges. If you right. spend a, about $1,000 on a really good filter system, yeah. we had one at our wellness center and we even provided water for hundreds of people that came yeah. to visit us and we replaced one filter after two years. It cost us six, $16. Or? It was a combination of... Um, it's, it's a system that was developed by the University of Houston, uh, the chemical engineering department, and it's been now scaled down to a size that'll go under your sink. And the, the, the bodies that asked for it to be developed was the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, Intel, and Merck, and they all needed a system that would right. give them clinically pure water. Right, right. And it's called Pure Water Systems, mm -hmm. and uh, you can look it up. It's a, it's a Pure water systems, plural, and it's a combination of superfine carbon, reverse osmosis, and deionization. Okay. So it, it even gets out radioactive particles and so forth. Great. So that's a great, great one. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to know what you think about reverse osmosis and what water filtration system you have in your house. Yeah. Um, so the choice of water filtration system is, is very dependent on what your water supply is. Um, if you are in a city, for example, that is served by a river that has multiple, you know, multiple cities on it, multiple users um, upstream, then you're dealing with a huge range of potential contamination um, and reverse osmosis starts to be the right choice. I happen to live in Seattle where we have a protected reservoir, so there's not likely to be much in the way of chemical contamination. So I can just use you know, a, a more standard um, cartridge filter. Um, but you know, I mean, if you want to be on the safe side, reverse osmosis is a good option. Um, but, but often it, you know, a simple cartridge will take you a long way towards uh, having water that's of the quality that you probably deserve. Um, you know, usually they're packed carbon cartridges, and um, um, it takes out some fluoride. But I am, I mean, don't throw anything at me. But I'm not as worried about <laughs> fluoride as as some people are. I, I mean, I. I you know, I, th I think one has to be careful because it's, you know, if you're getting fluoride in your water and in your toothpaste and you're getting it from a lot of sources, you, you need fluoride. But whether you need as much as you might get from drinking water, uh, that can be an issue. The fluoride for the drinking water as aluminum waste production mm -hmm. versus fluoride that might be found naturally in the earth. Right. But I mean, if you live in an area that has low fluoride naturally occurring in the water, you're going to have better teeth. Um, and stronger bones if you have fluoride. And they, no, there are also areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can have that discussion offline. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you spoke of advanced treatments mm -hmm. for our water, yeah. Um, could you number one list some what you think is advanced treatments? Okay. And uh, are you speaking advanced for America or advanced worldwide? Because when I was in Europe, they pretty much laughed at me when I said we use chlorine to clean our water. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For many many years in Sweden, they use ultraviolet purple light. The water right. tastes good. Right. And there's no harmful side effects right. in right. all the problems right. that chlorine. Right. Right. So are we talking world advances or just small advances yeah. for yeah. America? Uh, uh, <laughs> good question. Um, let me say, I, when I, I gave a talk at, at, this, at CDC once about chlorination byproducts and cancer, and um, after the talk, a guy in the back of the room raised his hand. He said, you know, I'm from Germany. I'm not going to imitate his accent, but I'm from Germany. And the, in Germany, we consider, if the water has chlorine in it, we consider that to be dirty water. Yeah. And, and I, you know, 
I mean, it's, it's crazy. If, if chlorine were a food additive, it would be banned, okay, because of I mean, the, chlorine, the effects of the chlorination byproducts. So um, you're touching on two things. I mean, water treatment primarily involves filtration and disinfection. And I, you know, for filtration, you're talking about fiber filters mostly, I mean, uh, or, um, membrane filters, uh, nanofiltration. So you can, re you can get most of the particles or, or most of, you can largely purify that water just with that filter. And so you almost don't need disinfection at all. In fact, you don't necessarily need disinfection if you have a good membrane filter except to protect against contamination down the line. I mean, one of the, and, and I think UV is a great option. UV kills cryptosporidium, and so UV has been introduced in a lot of places. Uh, ozone is used in a lot of places, although there's issues when you add ozone, you can get bromates forming, and bromates are carcinogens, so you have to be careful what kind of water you add it to. The justification that's often used for adding chlorine is it provides a residual disinfectant, because you saw those pipes, I mean, the, the sources of contamination in the distribution system uh, are manifold and um, they are, you know, you don't want to put this absolutely pure water into dirty pipes and just have another problem when you get to the tap. Um, that's why I really think advanced filtration is a filter at the tap because then you don't have to worry about what happens in the distribution system so much. You can really have very pure water just coming right out of the tap. So a, you know, a, member, a membrane filter at the tap is, would be my idea of, a, you know, with a good water treatment system at the source and a clean water supply before that, and good pipes would be nice too, then you have what I would consider to be an adequate water supply system. Um, and one might want to think about you know, th that way you can, you can treat the water that you're going to drink, that small percent that you're going to drink, to an adequate level that it deserves. Thanks. I've got two questions. You mentioned the correlation between bladder cancer and chlorine. What about mm -hmm. the swimming pool? That's a great question. It's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, you know, there have been sort of limited studies of uh, the exposures you get from from swimming, um, there have not been compelling studies, partly because you don't, you know, there's a lot more people that drink chlorinated water in frequently than people who swim regularly in chlorinated pools. But, you know, if, when I'm looking for a swimming pool, I try to find one that, you know, doesn't use chlorine or uses very low levels of chloramines to treat the water because I don't particularly think it's a great idea to be swimming in heavily chlorinated pools. Thank you. Yeah. And my next question, you mentioned about the filter being the tap. What about the filter on the shower heads as well? Uh, good question. I mean, it, um, the, you know, unless you have grossly contaminated water, the, my biggest concern in showers is going to be the, the chlorination byproducts that come out. Um, if you have high levels of chlorination byproducts, you can get either, you can, there's filters that you can put at the shower head or you can get whole house filters that will reduce the levels of chlorination byproducts uh, coming out of the shower. Again, um, how you do your point of use filters depends a lot on the, the quality of the water coming into the house. But, uh, if you have a source that has high levels of chlorination byproducts, I would suggest thinking about that as an option, yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my question is actually regarding to the nitrous fixers filtration in our water system that we use to actually treat the sewage. Um, because of the high levels of nitrous we have to cause, have you ever seen or found anything that has to link with um, DNA alterations? Um, nitrates in drinking water have been associated with this effects on infants, blue baby syndrome, and um, that's the primary concern. But um, you know, I mean, you're talking 
about water, the water, the wastewater treatment side of this. Yeah. So um, it, it's sort of it's a different issue in terms of how that's going to affect um, the drinking water. Um, you know, you, you, there's a lot of there's standards in terms of reducing levels of nitrates in drinking water to prevent health effects related to that. Well, the reason I ask is because um, from my studies when I, when I used to uh, back in my schooling, it shows that some of that water leaks into agricultures and affects plants, and they also use some of those nitrous fixers to increase the plant growth. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you've seen it with the, like you said, the blue baby syndrome, if you've yeah. seen that affect the livestock or any humans. Um, I'm not familiar with a study looking at that, but you know, I don't think those are things you want in high quantities in your drinking water. Okay, thank okay. you. How about those machines that uh, take the moisture from the air and give you drinking water? Are, is there a risk of if there's pollutants in the air that they'll actually, the water will have the pollutants? Um, I think you would get, you get pretty clean water out of those systems because you're, you know, the water vapor that you're getting out is relatively pure water. Um, and the, the, the concentrations of pollutants, I mean, it would depend, I suppose, on where you placed the thing and what was in the air where you placed it. And, you know, if you, if you were in a location where the air quality was particularly bad, you might have some issues with that. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The International Plumbing Code, which is adopted by all counties in the United States and throughout the world, allows for chlorine, iodine, and ozone for disinfection. We know how you feel about chlorine which is in group two of the periodic table with two electrons in the, seven electrons in the outer shell. Um, iodine has seven electrons in the outer shell, and so does fluoride. So the real thing is halogen displacement of the iodine. What is your opinion on the disinfection of iodine and ozone, according to the International Plumbing Code? And, um, you know, we know how you feel about chlorine, but consider fluoride as a halogen, and it displaces the heavier iodine atom, but what's your opinion about iodine and ozone for disinfection? Okay, iodine is, I mean, it's not commonly used for treating public water supplies. I, I um, you know, I think you, anytime you add a halogen, you, there's a, there's a potential risk there. Um, and I'm not saying there's no risk related to fluorine. I just, it's a, it's a lower quantity that it's put in the water. Um, as ozone is a different compound, I mean, it, you know, it's, and ozone um, disappears relatively rapidly. You can form some um, ozonated compounds, like bromate in particular, that can pose a risk. Um, but so it, it needs to be looked at very carefully in terms of the actual local water supply. I mean, what, the, the, what comes out of a water treatment plant after disinfection is heavily influenced by what's in the water before you add that disinfectant. And, you know, if you add these things to absolutely pure water, you're going to just get uh, an ion floating around. If you add them to water that's got a lot of organic matter in it, you get a huge array of organic compound, of, of halogenated organic compounds. And I'm a little uncomfortable with halogenated organic compounds, yeah. So um, I, would, I would suggest that uh, iodine, iodine isn't widely used and should be viewed with a level of caution similar to chlorine. It hasn't, there haven't been a lot of studies because it's not widely used. I mean, it's this whole problem of how do you prove the risk until you start killing people. Right? I live in the Clearwater area, and over there they put in the fluoride and chloramine. So I went down to my local store, down to Home Depot, Walmart, Lowe's, and I saw some pretty filters. In fact, expensive and pretty. And so I wrote down the phone numbers, and I called those companies, and I asked... When I call up, do you get rid of fluoride? Do you get rid of chloramines? And sometimes they would say, what's, what's that? And so I found that I had to really go online and do my own research to get rid of some of those high-tech chemicals. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a good source of information for that is the National Sanitation Foundation. They're the people who certify filters and tell you what a given filter will take out. 
And they've got a pretty good website in terms of telling you what filters will take out what compounds. So I would suggest you go there and, and you should be able to find the information you need pretty easily. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to talk about the iPhone. Um, I used to have a phone in the 90s, which was very costly. I went and got my first cell phone and I didn't notice anything happening. But since I've been using my iPhone, if I use that phone up to this side of my head, I notice that I have heat coming from it, a pain coming from it, and it's like it's heating up my brain. So I'm very sensitive to that mm -hmm. kind of frequency coming from that phone. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, I just do what I'm supposed to do and, you know, just talk on the speaker. Um, what I'm really worried about is I see a lot of teenagers and young children getting iPhones. Parents are buying the iPhones for these children yeah. and babies that are playing with yeah. the iPhone and using the icons, you know, because it's movable, something on the phone, parents talking, having coffee, not watching these children. Um, we have a study going on in Ontario right now. Uh, the children in the school in Collingwood in Ontario were getting very ill in the school. When they went out for recess, they felt better. When they went home again, they were sick again. So stomach cramps, indigestion, tired, not able to think straight, dizzy. And there's a study going on now that the Wi-Fi is affecting them. So the children that went to school and they went home with the Wi-Fi and it was never turned off, we're having major problems. So we're trying to prove that it's okay to have computers. We can't ever get rid of them, but let's take the routers out of all the places in the, in the school and stop letting them come to school with phones in their hands. And, you know, and there's a, the, the new research now is that they're trying to make a phone for nine-year-olds. They figure that's right. the age they should have their own uh, iPhone. So that's what I'm worried about. Right. And the parents have no idea that any of this is happening because it's just coming to fruition now. Like, we're just all talking about it now. Yeah. Right? Right. I mean, you, you, there's, there's a lot of, there's at least two or three interesting questions folded up in what you just said. Um, so, I, I, you know, first of all, in terms of kids with phones, um, you know, I think the developing brain, especially in very young kids, uh, is particularly susceptible to any harmful effects. Uh, and so from that perspective, mm -hmm. there's some concerns about young kids, especially very young kids, being around phones and you know, holding them up to their ears. The, the, by the way, the, the amount of radiation from a phone goes down with the square of the distance. So it, the, the, you, you don't have to move it away from your head very far to have a dramatic decrease in the level of exposure that you're getting. You know, it's like being on the speakerphone. The level is you know, so much smaller than what you get holding it up here that you're, you know, you're pretty safe holding it here. The good thing about most kids is they don't, they, you know, they think talking on the phone is something old people do and they're all texting. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and there's, you know, and I have concerns just in terms of putting the internet in a kid's pocket. I think there's, um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole other set of issues that, uh, that I uh, am in many ways more concerned about um, in terms of the social and effects of these devices. The, in terms of the, the relationship between uh, the issue of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi does use a similar kind of signal as a cell phone. Uh, it is, tends to be much weaker than the signal that you get holding a cell phone up. Um, I think you don't want to be close to routers. I think often very powerful routers are put into um, places like schools. Um, that unnecessarily, I think there. Um, I think there's some there's some utility in Wi-Fi that it's you know it's a little hard to get around. But I think, um, I mean, France they've banned them in elementary schools. I don't think you need Wi-Fi routers in elementary schools. I think um, you know if you get start to get into middle schools and high schools where you're expecting kids to be able to move around with a computer and take notes on them, it's a very useful device. Mm -hmm. I think. We don't want to necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one, but I, you know, and it, so I think it, you know, a certain amount of caution is definitely merited. 
and looking at issues like you're talking about is certainly warranted. Um, I, I, I am not somebody who would say, you know, let's get rid of all the Wi-Fi because of, of its utility. And actually, uh, the signal that you get when you have your phone on Wi-Fi is much lower than what you would have if you were trying to use the internet on a phone using a, a, the, the connection through your um, service provider. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. I appreciate your, your time and attention.